In part one, we covered the murders in Glasgow of Patricia Docker in 1968 and of Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock in 1969 and the subsequent murder investigations. Now we're going to go into all the theories and opinions that have been surrounding this infamous case for over 50 years. In an interview in 1972, three years after Helen Puttock's murder, the detective who had led the Bible John murder inquiry, Joel Beatty, said that despite the emphasis that had been put on the fact that the suspect had quoted from the Bible and had actually been named by the press Bible John because of this, he did not think that the killer was a religious man, just that he had a normal, intelligent, working knowledge of the Bible. He also said in the same article that it is quite incredible that this man has eluded us going on to express his regret that the killer had not been found. However, is it really that incredible that Bible John has never been caught, when over the years what we thought we knew about him was not really known at all? The Bible John case haunted Joe Beatty until his death in the year 2000. Now, while it appears that an extensive and detailed investigation into finding the killer of Patricia, Jemima and Helen had taken place and that every single line of inquiry was followed up, there are some who don't agree. One such person being Joe Jackson, who was a detective constable that worked on Patricia's murder inquiry and then following Helen Puttock's murder on the Bible John inquiry. I mentioned in part one that the man known as Bible John had become angry at the Barrowland Ballroom when the cigarette machine failed to dispense cigarettes for Jeannie and that the manager had become involved. Well, also present during this altercation between Bible John and the manager were two bouncers and when they were questioned by the police and gave their description of the man who had challenged the manager, they both said that he had been a lot shorter than the height Jeannie had said of 5 foot 10 inches or 1.78 metres. They also didn't agree with Jeannie that he had reddish fair hair, stating instead that he had brown, almost dark brown hair. They did agree, though, that he'd been well-spoken and had a Glaswegian accent. There were also other witnesses who came forward that gave a description to the police of the man Helen had been with that evening at the Barrowland Ballroom, which was much more similar to what the bouncer said than what Jeannie had said. However, Joe Jackson said in the Glasgow Times on the 7th of February 2022 that the lead detective had completely dismissed the bouncers and the other witnesses' description and had put far too much reliance on Jeannie's account of the suspect and felt that the other descriptions put forward should have been part of the investigation too and to this day he doesn't know why the lead detective discounted it. Further to this, in the book The Lost British Serial Killer, It states that Joe Jackson had said that on the Friday morning following Helen's body being found, Jeannie had admitted to another detective that she doubted she would be any help to the police, as she had had a bucket full to drink the previous night. Despite this, Jeannie went on to give not only a detailed account of what was said in the taxi journey, but also give a detailed description of the suspect. She was clearly under immense pressure to help the police as much as she could. Could this have led to inaccurate recollection of her memories? Joe Jackson also isn't convinced that the picture produced of the suspect by Jeannie's description is an actual depiction of the killer. He feels that it is highly stylized and had been made to look like a film star instead of a lookalike, meaning that back in 1969 they were probably looking for someone who likely didn't exist. Joe Jackson also said in the same article that he didn't believe either that the fact the suspect had quoted from the Bible was particularly significant, going on to say that most people at that time would have some knowledge of the scriptures as religious education was compulsory in schools, something which the lead detective Joe Beatty himself also agreed with despite, at the time of the investigation, giving this information to the media as it was felt it was important. Joe went on to say that he thinks Joe Beatty, the lead detective, realised later that he had made a mistake by making public the fact the suspect quoted Bible references. While Joe Jackson does not doubt for one second that Joe Beatty put everything into finding the killer of Patricia, Jemima and Helen and can't fault his dedication and determination, he did say in his book Chasing Killers that he felt Joe Beatty had been too narrowly focused in the way in which he was dealing with the inquiry and that he would not listen to others' views or opinions, but being only focused on one angle, 
his angle. Joe Jackson feels that the three murders should have been investigated separately and lead detectives should have worked collaboratively on each investigation to see if there really were solid links between all three murders, instead of it being assumed that one man had committed all three murders and therefore one investigation been put in place and been headed up by only one lead detective. Another criticism of the investigation back in 1969 was why a sketch of the John from Castle Milk that Ginny had been dancing with on the Thursday night was never produced. While appeals had been made for this man to come forward as a witness who could likely elaborate on what Helen's sister Ginny had said took place that evening, as well as give a description of the John the three had been in the company of, this man never came forward. But over the years, many, including Helen's husband, George Puttock, and the author, Professor David Wilson, have asked why more wasn't done to find this man. With George Puttock stating in the Mirror newspaper on the 22nd of March 2021 that if they had traced the other John, then he could have added to the famous description and picture of Bible John, but that instead he felt the police had placed too much pressure on Jean, who would have been drunk that night as well, and that her recollections would have been hazy. In the newspaper article, George Puttock said that while he doesn't understand why the police never did this, he said that it's still not too late and one can still be done. Professor David Wilson also wonders the same, stating in an article in the Glasgow Times on the 20th of December 2021 that Castle Milk John seemed to vanish from the investigation. Castle Milk John was not the only one to vanish. As following the murder of Helen Puttock in October 1969, there were no other officially linked murder cases. So why had Bible John suddenly stopped killing? Well, some believed that he may have moved away from the area, or perhaps he had only been visiting and only murdered when he was in the Glasgow area. Others speculated that maybe he had been imprisoned for another offence, or perhaps he had died. Another theory is that there had been other victims of Bible John. During the Bible John investigation, the records of every man between 25 to 35 who had been convicted of an indecent assault or rape were checked, and as a theory had been that perhaps Bible John had other victims that he had either consensual or forced sex with, as they had not been menstruating. It was a good theory, however following this inquiry it turned up nothing. However, years later, even as late as 2010, a number of women came forward to say that they believed they had been assaulted or raped by Bible John after spending the night dancing with a man they had met at the Barrowland Ballroom. With an assault happening before the murder of Patricia Docker in August 1968 and others taking place after Patricia Docker's murder but before the murders of Jemima and Helen. If it was the same man who had assaulted and raped these women, and who had murdered Patricia, Jemima and Helen, then the theory that he only killed if the women were menstruating was a viable one, and it also could explain the apparent large gap of 18 months between the first and second murders. Now, while this may provide possible answers to one question, the main question still remained. Who was Bible John, and would he ever be caught? Well, in 1996, as John McInnes' body is being exhumed, the police officers who had been working on the cold case since 1993 certainly believed they were very close to answering this question. Three years earlier, in 1993, the Bible John murder inquiry was reviewed to see if any new forensic developments could be used to establish the identity of Bible John, using the semen stain and hair found on Helen's stockings that had been kept in storage since 1969. John McInnes, who was 30 years old in 1969, had been interviewed by the police during the initial Bible John murder inquiry, and he had appeared in multiple identification parades, as he fitted the suspect's description and did resemble the Bible John picture that had been produced from Jeannie's description. John McInnes had also been a regular at the Barrowland Ballroom, and had apparently been there the night before Helen Puttock was there. However, following being interviewed by the police, and according to the book The Face of Bible John by Steve McGregor, having his clothes checked by detectives who found he owned nothing that resembled the suit worn by Bible John, and following Jeannie being adamant this was not the man who she and her sister had shared a taxi home with, as well as the fact he didn't have the overlapping front teeth, he was cleared, although many detectives still believed he was their killer. 
although the lead detective, Joe Beatty, never believed this, going as far as saying at the time of the exhumation that John McInnes was not Bible John. When the murder inquiry was reviewed in 1993 and a DNA sample could be retrieved, despite John McInnes having taken his own life in 1980 at the age of 41, the police sought a comparison nonetheless and approached his sister, who was eventually persuaded to provide a sample for comparison in the hope it would put an end to the speculation and finally rule her brother out as being Bible John. However, according to the Face of Bible John book, the exact opposite would be the case, as the sample provided by John's sister when compared to the DNA taken from Helen's stockings was said to be an 80% match. And so the police, positive they were close to uncovering exactly who Bible John was, requested an exhumation of John McInnes's body, which was granted by the Crown Office. And on the 2nd of February 1996, the lengthy task of removing John's coffin from below his mother's coffin, who had died seven years after him, began. Everyone involved was confident that upon extracting bone sample from John McInnes's body and it being compared to the semen sample found in Helen's stockings would not only be a quick process but it would finally mean the Bible John murderer had been identified. However, that was not the case. The process took months, with the samples being passed from one set of university scientists to another while everyone, including the upset and distressed McInnes family, waited for the conclusion of the testing. But finally, at a cost of £1 million or $1.1 million, scientists concluded, according to the Herald newspaper on the 5th of July 1996, that the DNA sample taken from John McInnes's thigh bone was different from that taken from Helen Puttick's stockings. The statement went on to say that, due to the age and bad state of preservation of the biological evidence, particularly the semen stain, we concluded that there is not sufficient evidence from the current DNA information to link John McInnes to the scene of the murder of Helen Puttock. The results of these DNA analyses provide no evidence to suggest that the semen stain or hair left near the body of Helen Puttock originated from John McInnes and that there was not any provable family link between the author of the semen stain and the family of John McInnes. Apparently, the bite mark on Helen's body was also compared to John McInnes's teeth, but that the bite mark showed insufficient points of detail for any degree of probability to be attributed to its authorship, and the evidence would indicate that he was not the author of the semen stain found on Helen Puttock's stockings concluding that the evidence, therefore, did not point convincingly to John McInnes being the originator of the bite. Following this, in July 1996, John McInnes was finally excluded as being the source of the semen stain and comprehensively cleared by the Crown of having any involvement with Bible John or the case. My interpretation of this was that despite the degradation of the sample, it could still be at least determined that John McInnes was not a match. The family of John McInnes said that it had been a distressing experience for them, but that they were delighted by the news. Others said that, although it was understood that the police had a duty to investigate unsolved murders, it was felt that the way the police handled the case and the exhumation had been outrageous and that the family deserved an apology. It was following John McInnes being cleared of being Bible John that the original lead detective of the inquiry, Joe Beatty, told the Herald newspaper that there was never evidence to directly link the murders of the three women to one killer. So not only was it believed that the picture of Bible John may not actually have been what he looked like, but also that there could have been more than one killer targeting women at the ballrooms back in the late 60s. And now that an attempt had been made by the police to finally find out who Bible John was, which had not only caused distress to John McInnes' family and proved nothing, but it had cost a whopping £1 million or $1.1 million to do it, and also that it appeared the semen sample that had been found on Helen's stockings appeared to have not been stored correctly over the years and was in such a bad state, would there ever be another chance to find out once and for all who had been terrorising Glasgow dancers back in the late 60s? Well, certainly the chances of this were becoming slimmer the more time went on. However, that didn't stop the speculation over the years about who this man, or men, could be. 
one of whom is an already known Scottish serial killer currently in prison, Peter Tobin. Now I'm not going to go into detail about Peter Tobin, but I'm going to give basic details about him and why it is thought by some that this man could be Bible John. In May 2007, following a six-week trial, 60-year-old Peter Tobin was given a life sentence to spend at least 21 years in prison before being eligible for parole for the rape and murder of 23-year-old Angelica Kluck in Glasgow in September 2006. Peter Tobin murdered Angelica Kluck two years after being released from serving a 10-year prison sentence for the double rape of two 14-year-old girls in 1993 when he was 47 years old. At the time of Angelica's murder, Peter Tobin was working as a church handyman in Glasgow and going by the name of Pat McLaughlin, no doubt as he didn't want anyone to know who he really was and that he was on the Violent and Sex Offenders Register. After he had brutally beaten, raped and stabbed Angelica 19 times, he then put her body in an underground chamber beneath the floor of the church. According to Wikipedia, Angelica was still alive when she was placed under the floorboards. Following Angelica's body being discovered five days later, Peter Tobin was arrested in London, where he had fled after the murder. Following Peter Tobin's conviction for the murder of Angelica Kluck, Operation Anagram, a nationwide police investigation, was set up to delve into Peter Tobin's life and movements over the years to try and determine if he could be connected to dozens of murders and missing girls and young women. According to the book The Face of Bible John by Steve McGregor, when Peter Tobin was interviewed by the police and asked to provide information about other murders he may have carried out in order to put the minds of family members at rest, he said, I don't give a fuck about them. Peter Tobin has maintained this stance ever since and has never cooperated with the police in any way. Not to be deterred though, as part of Operation Anagram, Peter Tobin's previous homes in Scotland and England were forensically searched. Upon searching a previous property of Peter Tobin's in Margate in England, sadly, in June 2007, the remains of 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton was found, who had last been seen on the 10th of February 1991 as she waited for a bus home to Falkirk in Scotland. And then five months later, on the 16th of November 2007, a second body was found at the Margate property and it was 18-year-old Dinah McNichol, who had last been seen alive on the 5th of August 1991, hitchhiking home after attending a music festival. Peter Tobin stood trial for Vicky Hamilton's murder in November 2008 and after a month-long trial, he was convicted of a rape and murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. He again stood trial on the 16th of December 2009 for the murder of Dinah McNichol and after deliberating for only 13 minutes, the jury found him guilty of kidnapping, drugging and murdering Dinah McNichol and he was again sentenced to a life sentence, his third, and a recommendation was made that he should never be released. Following these convictions, Operation Anagram began to look into the possibility that Peter Tobin could have been involved in a further 13 unsolved murders, which included the murders of Patricia Docker, Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock. When Joe Jackson spoke to the STV News, he said that in his informed opinion, he is convinced that Bible John is already locked up, as he thinks that Peter Tobin is Bible John saying in the Glasgow Times in February 2022 that when he saw a photograph of Peter Tobin when he was arrested for the murder of Angelica Kluck, that this is as near to Bible John as you're going to get. However, it's not only because he feels the Bible John picture and Peter Tobin back in 1969 look very similar in appearance, it's also because Peter Tobin moved away from Glasgow in 1969 to England with his soon-to-be wife Margaret the same year as the murders of Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock. And incidentally, Peter also met his soon-to-be wife Margaret at the Barrowland Ballroom. Joe Jackson believes he moved from Glasgow at this time due to the massive police presence around the ballrooms and the Bible John picture being released. He believes that the murders also stopped because Peter Tobin had moved away from the area. Peter Tobin, like Bible John, knew Glasgow very well and according to the Lost British Serial Killer book, Peter Tobin lived only a couple of hundred yards or metres from where Helen Puttock's body had been found. 
Some other similarities stated in the Lost British Serial Killer book by the authors Professor David Wilson and Paul Harrison came following them constructing a profile of Bible John and Peter Tobin and through analysing these profiles and that of Dr Britton which was compiled at the time of the original murder inquiry they identified that both Bible John and Peter Tobin were solitary men, not team players and that they kept themselves to themselves which had obviously been a very good trait to have as Bible John had eluded the police despite the mass media attention and despite apparently knowing so much about this man. The authors also said that both men were travellers, with Bible John leaving the safety of his own home to go and find victims from the ballrooms before returning home once again and after Peter Tobin had murdered he made sure to travel far from where the murder had happened, fleeing to London after he had murdered Angelica Cluck. And then there's the 18 month gap between the murder of Patricia Docker and Jemima MacDonald. Well, in that time, Peter Tobin had met, lived with and ultimately married Margaret, a marriage which took place 10 days before the murder of Jemima MacDonald. According to the website missingandmurdered.co.uk, Peter Tobin's three ex-wives said that they had been repeatedly imprisoned, throttled, beaten and raped by him, with one of his wives, Margaret, saying that he had savagely stabbed her in her vagina and left her to die and that he continued to have sex with her when she was menstruating and that it seemed to excite him and Bible John's three victims were all menstruating. So if Peter Tobin was treating his wife that he was with at the time of the Bible John murders like this then perhaps he didn't feel the need to target anybody else. Could this reasonably explain the gap between Bible John's killings? What about the reason for the killings of Bible John ending after Helen Puttock? Well, Peter Tobin was arrested not long after the murder of Helen Puttock for another crime and actually spent 13 months in prison, according to the lost British serial killer. If Peter Tobin was Bible John, then this is certainly one reason why the killings of Bible John stopped after Helen Puttock's murder. Something else that possibly points to Peter Tobin being Bible John links back to an assault that took place in 1968. According to the website crimetraveller.org, a lady called Patricia Chambers came forward to the police in 2010 to say that when she was 15 years old, she had met a man at the Barrowland Ballroom and he had introduced himself as Jim McLaughlin. She went on to say that he had spiked her drink and dragged her into an alleyway, stamped on her face and shouted obscenities at her. Thankfully, passers-by heard the commotion and came to her rescue and her attacker ran from the scene. She believes this man was Peter Tobin and that Peter Tobin was Bible John. Also, we know that McLaughlin was an alias that Peter Tobin used as he called himself Pat McLaughlin at the time he murdered Angelica Cluck. Could this have been an early attack from Peter Tobin as Bible John? It was also discovered by Operation Anagram that Peter Tobin would use John as an alias, using it a lot of the time with the surname Semple. And remember, Jeannie had thought that the man who she and her sister Helen had been in the taxi with had called himself John and either Sempleson or Templeton. Could it in fact have been that he called himself John Semple, one of his aliases? Bible John and Peter Tobin also stood out from the crowd with the way they dressed, both opting to dress smartly and wear similar style ties and wore their hair short at a time when the style was to wear it long. Also, Peter Tobin was a Catholic and all of his ex-wives say that he was knowledgeable about religion and the Bible and Bible John was literally named after quoting from the Bible, although some question whether this may have been a red herring. Both men were very polite, chivalrous and made women feel comfortable until they were alone with them, that is. And both killers took souvenirs from their victims. Bible John took his victims' handbags and Peter Tobin took jewellery. In conclusion to the research undertaken in the book The Lost British Serial Killer, it is stated that as far as the authors were concerned, Peter Tobin was the killer of Patricia Docker, Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock. However, despite the similarities between Bible John and Peter Tobin, there also are differences, such as their ages and the victims' ages. In 1968 and 1969, Peter Tobin would have been 21 and 22 years old. However, the Bible John killer was said to have been between 25 and 35. 
There was also their hair colour. Bible John was described by Jeannie as having fair reddish hair, but Peter Tobin's wife at the time, Margaret, said that he had brown or dark brown hair. Although the bouncers at the Barrowland Ballroom and other witnesses did say that the man who had been with Helen Puttock and her sister Jeannie that night had brown, almost dark brown hair, but this description had been dismissed in favour of Jeannie's. Also, there was a height disparity between Jeannie's description of Bible John and Peter Tobin's height. Jeannie said that the man she and her sister had been with was tall, 5 foot 10 inches to 6 foot, or 1.78 to 1.83 metres, whereas Peter Tobin is a lot shorter. Again, though, the bouncers at the Barrowland Ballroom, whose description was dismissed, said that the man they had seen arguing with the manager had been a lot shorter than Jeannie had said. The victims' ages were also very different, with Bible John killing 25 to 32 year olds, whereas Peter Tobin's victims had been aged from 15 to 23 years old. However, the Lost British Serial Killer book thinks a possibility for this, if Peter Tobin was actually Bible John, could be that when Peter Tobin was 21 or 22 years old, he maybe was attracted to older women. However, when he murdered in 1993 and in 2006, he would have been mid-40s to late 50s, and so possibly would have been more attracted to younger girls. However, in an article in Herald newspaper on the 20th of November 2021, the detective who actually caught Peter Tobin and who investigated any links with Peter Tobin to the murders of Patricia Docker, Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock, David Swindle, who is retired and now operates Victims Abroad and supports families of people who die abroad, says that during the investigation, any potential links between Peter Tobin being Bible John were investigated. However, no evidence was found to link him with the murders of Patricia, Jemima or Helen. Going on to say that, I am not satisfied the same person was involved in these three cases. David Swindle went on to say that Peter Tobin had moved to Brighton with Margaret before the murder of Jemima MacDonald. However, it is said in the Lost British Serial Killer book that Peter Tobin's wife at the time, Margaret, said that he would disappear at times and she wouldn't know where he had been. So it is possible that he could very well have gone back to Glasgow to carry out the murders of Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock before fleeing back to Brighton. Although, in the Face of Bible John book, it states that Peter Tobin's wife Margaret is certain that she and Peter Tobin remained together in Brighton in England from the time of their wedding on the 6th of August 1969 to him being arrested two weeks later on the 20th of August for a series of burglaries, so he couldn't have murdered Jemima MacDonald in Glasgow on the 16th of August 1969. David Swindle also confirmed that he had seen photos of Peter Tobin back in the 1960s and that he definitely didn't have red hair as shown in the artist's impression. But the validity of the artist's impression made by Jeannie has also been brought into question. Although up until her death in September 2010, at the age of 74, Helen Puttock's sister Jeannie insisted that Peter Tobin was not the man she had shared a taxi with that fateful evening in 1969. Now, like everything else with this case, even whether Peter Tobin has been categorically ruled out as being Bible John or not isn't clear. In an article in the STV News on the 23rd of February 2018, it says that police are unsure if DNA technology will be able to prove if Peter Tobin is Bible John or not due to the poor storage of samples down the years. In the Mirror newspaper on the 22nd of March 2021, it reported that Peter Tobin himself had denied that he was Bible John, although I take that with a pinch of salt, as he had not cooperated with the police at all regarding his involvement in any other murders. In the Glasgow Times on the 7th of February 2022, it said that Operation Anagram had been launched to investigate Peter Tobin's possible involvement in other murders, and by 2011, when the investigation was wound down, there had been no evidence or information found that could link Peter Tobin conclusively with the murders of Patricia Docker, Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock, including the DNA found on Helen's stockings due to its deterioration. And so the theory that Peter Tobin had been involved in their murders had been discounted. 
But then, in the Hunt for Bible John documentary, which was released on the 21st of November 2021, retired detective David Swindle said that the DNA found on Helen's stockings is not Peter Tobin's DNA, as his profile had been compared against it. So, had scientists now been able to extract a clear DNA sample from Helen's stockings that could be compared to Peter Tobin's, which had ruled him out? Despite the fact that Joe Jackson claimed that it was unlikely the evidence collected had been treated and stored to a degree that a clear, uncontaminated DNA sample could be extracted? Either way, it appears Peter Tobin has been ruled out as being Bible John by many, but not by everyone. While there are different opinions around if Peter Tobin could be Bible John, what is agreed on is that serial killers do not tend to start killing so late in life. Peter Tobin was mid-40s when he killed Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol in 1993, which indicates that he likely had killed before 1993, with Scottish criminal profiler Ian Stephen saying in Glasgow Live in February 2018, you don't usually start being a serial killer in the 40s or 50s, you start fairly early on in your life which could suggest that Peter Tobin could have been killing for approximately 40 years before he was caught, meaning it is possible that he had killed back in 1968 when he was 21 years old. Peter Tobin isn't the only serial killer that has been put forward as potentially being Bible John, with Helen Puttock's husband at the time, George, believing that the real Bible John was in fact the English serial killer Peter Sutcliffe. According to Wikipedia, Peter Sutcliffe, who was dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper, was found guilty in 1981 and given 20 consecutive life sentences, ordered to serve a minimum of 30 years before being eligible for parole for murdering 13 women and attempting to murder a further 7 women between 1975 and 1980. However, in 2010, one year before Peter Sutcliffe would have been eligible to apply for parole, his concurrent life sentences were converted to a whole life order, meaning he would never be released. And he died in prison custody in November 2020 at the age of 74. George Puttock, Helen Puttock's husband at the time of her murder, never believed the rumours that Peter Tobin was Bible John. Having looked through Peter Tobin's bag of trophies from his victims upon his arrest, and there being nothing to connect Peter Tobin to Helen. And when Peter Tobin was officially ruled out, George's view of Bible John being Peter Sutcliffe was just reinforced. And following him investigating Peter Sutcliffe himself, George told in a newspaper article just why he had come to that conclusion. According to the article in the Daily Record newspaper on the 22nd of March 2021, George first began to think that Bible John was Peter Sutcliffe when he found out that Peter Sutcliffe had favoured using a ball-peen hammer when attacking his victims. At the time of his wife Helen Puttock's murder, the police had told George that she had suffered blunt force injury to her head and the police had even asked George if he had hit Helen, which he had of course denied. And so upon finding out that Peter Sutcliffe would use a hammer when attacking his victims, he began to investigate to see if Peter Sutcliffe could have ventured into Scotland in 1968 and 1969 and had potentially murdered Patricia, Jemima or Helen Puttock. And it turned out that yes, George was able to place Peter Sutcliffe in Glasgow at the time of Helen Puttock's murder believing then that Helen had been his first victim. But there was more that had led George to believe his theory very viable. He said in the same Daily Record article that he had discovered a photograph of Peter Sutcliffe from the 60s and that he bore a remarkable resemblance to the pictures police put out of Bible John, going on to say that in the picture Peter Sutcliffe was digging a grave, as Peter Sutcliffe's job in the 1960s was a grave digger. He then remembered that Jeannie had told the police that the John they had been with had shown Helen something that night which had surprised her, and when Jeannie had asked what it was, she was told to mind her own business, with some believing that it may have been a military ID or a police ID. But George thinks that this man had perhaps shown Helen a grave digger's card, which had surprised her, as it would anyone. 
Now, while George said he'd found a picture of Peter Sutcliffe from back in the 60s and had said he was clean shaven, it appeared that Peter Sutcliffe had suddenly grown a beard around the time of Helen's murder. George has theorised that this sudden appearance of a beard could have been because he had received scratches to his face from Helen, who George said had been wearing a large ring that evening and would most definitely have fought hard for her life, possibly scratching her attacker's face. George also found out that through Peter Sutcliffe's work as an HGV driver, he had often travelled throughout the country. Although, according to Wikipedia, Peter Sutcliffe didn't begin work as a lorry driver until late 1976. And then there was the fact that Peter Sutcliffe was English and had an English accent, not a Glaswegian one, that it was said the John with Helen and Jeannie that evening had had. George had apparently repeatedly asked the police over the years to at least check his theory out, even if just to rule the idea out. But as far as he is aware, this has never been done, or at least he has never been told Peter Sutcliffe has been checked out, with George saying that nothing will convince me it wasn't Sutcliffe unless there is irrefutable evidence, such as DNA, that it was someone else. Now there's one final serial killer to have been linked to possibly being Bible John, someone who I've mentioned in detail in a previous episode, Angus Sinclair. An article in the Express newspaper on the 4th of February 2018 revealed that an amateur detective known only as Nate had carried out a detailed investigation into the Bible John murders. However, Nate has said that the first of the three murders, Patricia Docker, is commonly and mistakenly attributed to Bible John, as Nate also thinks that there was more than one murderer haunting the dance halls of Glasgow in the late 1960s, believing that it had been Angus Sinclair who had murdered 25-year-old Patricia Docker and that Peter Tobin had murdered 32-year-old Jemima MacDonald and 29-year-old Helen Puttock. From the investigation, Nate told the Express newspaper that he had discovered that Angus Sinclair's wife's brother, Robert Hamilton, and his wife lived in the same street as Patricia Docker's parents in Langside Place, with Nate suggesting that Angus Sinclair would probably have known Patricia due to this. He went on to suggest that when Angus had been visiting his sister's brother, he had perhaps persuaded Patricia to go on a date with him that fateful night but then had strangled her in his van. Apparently, the police have always believed that Patricia had been killed elsewhere and her body then transported to the lane where it was found. Nate then turned his attention to Jemima MacDonald and explained why he believed Peter Tobin was her murderer. Nate found out that Jemima MacDonald had lived immediately next door to a man called Daniel Tobin, who Nate believes was almost certainly a cousin of Peter Tobin. Nate believes that Peter Tobin, who was living in Brighton in England with his wife Margaret by the time of Jemima's murder, had travelled back to Scotland to visit his cousin Daniel, at which point he had seen or met Jemima and had gone on to murder her and leave her body in the nearby derelict building that he knew about from him visiting his presumed cousin Daniel. Nate believes that it was also Peter Tobin who had murdered Helen Puttock, and his investigation uncovered a flat nearby where he believes Helen had been murdered before her body had been moved to where it was found. He discovered that Helen and Jeannie's aunt, Agnes Gowans, also had a flat in Errol Street, with Helen staying with her mum at 129 Errol Street and Aunt Agnes living at 107 Errol Street, so not far from each other. Nate reports that apparently someone who lived in the same area at the time suggested that Aunt Agnes would regularly go away, possibly on holidays, and that both Helen and her sister Jeannie would use their aunt's flat for romantic encounters. Nate believes that Helen had taken John, or Peter Tobin, who she had met at the Barrowland Ballroom, back to her aunt's flat and that she had been murdered there. Nate believes that this man had then cleaned up the flat before dumping Helen's body yards or metres away where it was later found. Apparently, the door of the close where the aunt's flat was opens directly onto the area where Helen's body was found. Nate is now urging police to examine Agnes Gowan's former dwelling to search for any surviving DNA evidence. So, that's the serial killers that some believe may have been Bible John and why, but it's not just serial killers' names that have been put forward over the years as possibly being Bible John. 
Paul Harrison, the author of the 2013 book Dancing with the Devil and a retired UK police officer, has stated in his book that he believes Bible John was a serving Glasgow police officer and that he believes he has discovered his name. Paul Harrison says that apparently the lead detective in the Bible John inquiry, Joe Beatty, told him that he had suspected a police officer was involved and had been investigating this particular officer. However, that apparently when Joe Beatty's superiors found out that he was carrying out an investigation of a police officer being Bible John, they ordered him to shut down that line of inquiry. He also stated that on numerous occasions, when Helen Puttock's sister Jeannie attended the police station to attend lineups or be interviewed again, she had told Joe Beatty that one of the police officers in the station she was attending was the man she and her sister shared a taxi home with that evening but that apparently Joe had told her she must be mistaken as the man she was referring to was a police officer. Paul also goes on to say that he believes Castle Milk John had also been a police officer, perhaps undercover, and that the piece of paper Bible John had shown Helen, who had been surprised, was in fact his police warrant card, going on to say, according to the crimetraveller.org website, that he had been able to uncover a number of witness statements which described a man showing a police identification card who fits the description of the so-called Bible John. He says that the police officer he believes is Bible John had taken early retirement not long after the Bible John killings and had moved away from the area. Paul Harrison was also the co-author of the book The Lost British Serial Killer in which Professor David Wilson stated that Following their investigation, as far as he was concerned, Peter Tobin was Bible John. The author Steve McGregor, in his book The Face of Bible John, addresses this theory that Bible John had possibly been a police officer, saying that despite Joe Beatty apparently telling Paul Harrison that he believed Bible John was a police officer and that he'd been told to shut this inquiry down, he was surprised that even after Joe Beatty had retired and continued to openly talk about the case, why he wouldn't have ever mentioned this theory. Again, Steve McGregor questions why, if Jeannie had been shown a police warrant card that evening and had in fact seen a police officer she believed was the man she and Helen had shared a taxi with, why would she never have mentioned this fact in the numerous interviews she'd carried out right up until her death in 2010? And presumably Jeannie would have repeated this theory to Helen's husband George, as why wouldn't she? Then wouldn't George have mentioned this fact in one of the many interviews he has carried out? He certainly was happy to voice his theory that he believes Bible John is the Yorkshire Ripper. Perhaps when Jeannie was told by the lead detective Joe Beatty, who she appeared to have a good relationship with, that she was mistaken and that the police officer could not have been Bible John, she believed him and put it to the back of her mind, not wanting to hinder the investigation. And also, Joe Beatty appeared absolutely determined to find Bible John, so much so that it had perhaps given him tunnel vision a wee bit. Would he really have quite so easily given up on investigating the police officer he thought could have been Bible John just because he was ordered to, and instead spend the rest of his years being dogged by not having caught Bible John? Another point Steve McGregor mentions in his book is the exhumation of John McInnes. If senior officers believed for one second that they in fact knew that Bible John had been one of their police officers who was now retired and living elsewhere in the country, would they risk facing backlash for exhuming a body at the cost of £1 million or $1.1 million and causing such distress to the family members of John McInnes? What do you think? Which side are you leaning towards? Paul Harrison states that he passed on all details to the police including the name of the serving police officer at the time of the murders who he believes is Bible John. While the question of who the infamous Bible John was has kept this mystery alive over the years and continues to split people's opinions and theories, a two-part BBC documentary, The Hunt for Bible John, which aired in November 2021, has brought, according to the Daily Record newspaper, on the 11th of January 2022, dozens of names that could be Bible John being sent in by the public following updated images of Bible John being produced, which this time includes his open mouth and showing the overlapping teeth for the first time drawn by police forensic artist Melissa Dring. 
The Daily Record article said that one man who had been put forward was said to be a very religious man who worked in a laboratory at Glasgow Royal Infirmary, who told his work colleagues at the time that he frequented dance halls at the weekend and it was said that his behaviour became increasingly bizarre and that he looked remarkably similar to the original image of Bible John that was produced. However, sadly, this man took his own life in the mid-70s. What was interesting, though, is that Bible John had mentioned to Helen and Jeannie in the taxi ride that he worked in a laboratory. Another name put forward was a man who was a fairground worker from Glasgow who also attended the Barrowland Ballroom frequently and was known to quote the Bible, even naming his children after disciples, with a relative apparently telling the Daily Record that it was bizarre that the police never suspected this man. The original images of Bible John were also digitally aged to look like a man in his 80s and following seeing these updated and digitally aged images on the BBC documentary, 74-year-old Pauline Badger told the Sun newspaper that she is convinced she met Bible John, saying that it looked like a lab worker from an RAF base in Halton in England where she had worked and where 19-year-old trainee nurse Rita Ellis was sexually assaulted and strangled with her underwear in November 1967, three months before the murder of Patricia Docker in February 1968. With Pauline going on to say that she had a vivid mental map of him walking and talking with the funny front teeth. Pauline believes that DNA found on Rita Ellis could reveal who Bible John really is and those working on Rita's cold case said this information was interesting and worth checking out. Also, according to an article in the Daily Record newspaper, Professor David Wilson, who said that whilst it is not definite proof and the absence of DNA means it unlikely that it will ever be proven who Bible John was, that these pictures look to me uncannily like Peter Tobin. So we've heard all the theories and opinions about who Bible John could be and the critique about the original investigation and lead detective Joe Beatty, but what about the victim's family members who had someone they loved taken from them? And despite all the theories about who Bible John could be, after more than 50 years, they have still not had justice for their loved ones. Patricia Docker left behind her four-year-old son Alex and her mum and dad, who she and her son were living with. Alex's words about the murder of his mother were read out in the BBC documentary The Hunt for Bible John. He said that he mercifully was unable to remember the grief he must have gone through or the events leading up to or directly after his mother's murder, but admitted that despite this disconnect, he still finds it difficult to think about. He told how Patricia's parents both died not long after their daughter was brutally taken from them, with Alex feeling that this tragedy had in fact hastened their death. He said that there is no one left alive now who could tell him more about his mother, as he said his father had died three years prior to the documentary being aired. He said he would dearly have loved to have known more about his mother, Patricia, and her life, but he was told that for the brief time they shared together, she was an excellent mother. Jemima's niece, Anne, who had been 10 years old at the time of Jemima's murder, also spoke on the documentary. She said that her Aunt Jemima's murder had haunted her and her family their whole lives. She said that her mum, Jemima's sister, blamed herself for Jemima's murder. Jemima and her sister would regularly go out dancing in the ballrooms together, but Jemima's sister wasn't able to make it out with her sister that night. Anne went on to say that her mother had started drinking heavily following Jemima's murder and was eventually taken into hospital. Anne feels very angry about what happened to Jemima and what her and her family have gone through since, with her mother spending the rest of her life looking behind her. She feels cheated out of life because of just how severely her Aunt Jemima's murder affected her mother. While we have heard that George Puttock, Helen's husband at the time of her murder, thinks that Bible John was the Yorkshire Ripper, he and Helen's two young sons, David 5 and Michael 18 months, were deeply affected by Helen's murder. Speaking on the documentary The Hunt for Bible John, George told of how he had tried to protect his sons from the brutality that had happened to their mother and had made the decision to tell them both that Helen had been hit by a bus and had been killed instead of the awful truth that she'd been beaten, raped and violently strangled to death. 
However, when his youngest son, Michael, was about seven years old, he apparently heard the truth from a friend at school, and George said that Michael had been furious that his father had lied to him and had been absolutely devastated by what had happened to his mum, which really affected him and the father and son relationship. From then on, sadly, George and Michael's relationship deteriorated, with Michael pretty much accusing his dad of murdering his mum. While this deeply wounded George, he could understand Michael's pain and hoped that over time his young son would come to forgive him and understand why he had lied. However, that was not to be the case, and sadly the pair have remained estranged over the years. George also said on the documentary that they say time is a healer, but it never does heal. It is still a vivid memory. He went on to say that he was so proud to be married to Helen and had felt like such a lucky chap. George did remarry and lives with his wife Mavis in his childhood home of Berkshire in England. At the time of the documentary being aired in 2021, George is now in his 80s and in bad health and desperately would like to see the person who murdered Helen caught and punished for taking his wife and mother of his children from them and for causing such untold heartache and destruction to him and his family. However, with retired senior detective David Swindle, who not only caught Peter Tobin, but led the Operation Anagram investigation into uncovering if Peter Tobin had been involved in any other murders, including that of Helen Puttock, saying in the Herald newspaper in November 2021 that, I would hope someday someone will be caught, but the chances of that are very slim. And with the deterioration in the DNA sample found on Helen Puttick's stockings and key witness Jeannie now being dead, it really doesn't look hopeful. However, Police Scotland continue to remain committed to solving the murders of Patricia Docker, Jemima MacDonald and Helen Puttock, saying in a statement in the Glasgow Times on the 7th of February 2022 that they are subject to review and any new information about their deaths will be investigated. Let's hope that with more people coming forward with information about who Bible John could be following the BBC documentary The Hunt for Bible John, that it may just lead to the infamous Bible John being uncovered. Someone must know something. So what do you think? What are your opinions and theories? Let me know on social media or email me at contact at scottishmurders.com I'd love to hear what you think to these questions after hearing what others think. Do you agree with Professor David Wilson that Bible John was one man and is Peter Tobin? Or are you leaning towards Joe Beattie and David Swindle in thinking it may have been different men who carried out the murders of Patricia, Jemima and Helen? Do you think the police did the right thing in exhuming John McInnes's body? And what about the Bible John description and drawing? What's your opinion on that? Do you think Detective Joe Beatty focused too much on what Helen's sister Jeannie said and should instead have listened more to the bouncer's description of Bible John? But then, the bus driver and conductor did say they saw a man matching Jeannie's description on their bus leaving the area where Helen was murdered. So, was Jeannie more accurate than she was given credit for? Do you think the reason for Patricia, Jemima and Helen being murdered was because they had been on their period and it had disgusted or excited their killer? Or do you think it was because he had a very low opinion of women who were married and had children who were out enjoying themselves? Some people back in 1968 and 1969 certainly felt that they had brought their murders on themselves. Someone actually went on TV and said this, and it can be seen in the documentary The Hunt for Bible John. What's your opinion on this? While those working on the Bible John murder inquiry back in 1969 certainly appear to have covered every possible avenue in the hunt to find this man, and Joe Beatty appeared determined to leave no stone unturned. And remember back then that there were no CCTV cameras or forensic science techniques. Do you think it's unfair to criticise the investigation now, or do you think more could have been done back in 1969? So many questions. Now, over the years, there have been numerous documentaries and books that all focus on Bible John and who he could be, a few of which I've mentioned in this episode. But now there is something different, in the form of a drama with music stage production called Dancing with the Devil, directed by Paul Moore, which looks back at the murders of Patricia, Jemima and Helen following their night out at the Barrowland Ballroom. 
While this is backed by iconic 60s songs, along with live music, which was specifically chosen to give women and the victims a voice, and is full of Glasgow humour, it is still dark as it delves into the misogynistic mindset that prevailed at the time, exploring the angle of was it a serial killer or was it closer to home. It is, however, fully respectful of the victims and their families, so much so that following last year's tour around Scotland, one of the victim's husband and family members appreciated the case being highlighted, which prompted another of the victim's families to give their blessing. It touches on issues that are still relevant and echo today, such as violence against women. So this drama with music stage production is definitely not to be missed. You can find these links in the show notes or at scottishmurders.com.